<laughs> Welcome to the real Mr. Beer, Mr. Beer's own channel. We're here to provide, we are here at long last to provide homebrewing guidance and tips, equipping you with all sorts of beer knowledge. My name is Tim Falk, I am not Josh Ratliff, he is still out. And here at Mr. Beer, I am our customer service manager. I am also the kind of team lead for the Brew Art line of products. Um, and I've been here with Mr. Beer Brewing for about three years. Today, um, we are gonna brew our Thunder Bay IPA recipe. Um, it's not quite as advanced as all grain brewing, but as far as Mr. Beer goes, it's definitely on the advanced side. Um, it's about 6.7% ABV, alcohol by volume. Um, it has an SRM of 10. SRM, as you may know, stands for Standard Reference Method. It's a way for brewers to kind of tell what color their beer is going to be. It's the system that modern brewers use to specify color. You know, before we get too much farther about on this topic, I just want to mention this is a partial mash recipe. The thing about partial mash recipes is that there's a lot of sitting around waiting for water to heat up. And we kind of figured you guys didn't want to watch that. So we went ahead and got our partial mash started already. Matt, if you want to switch to the stove cam, this is our partial mash. It's our grains. We'll kind of talk through what we did for this part here in a bit. But first, this has about 15 minutes left to go. So while we wait for our partial mash to finish, we were going to go ahead and talk about the style first before we get to brew and kind of switch things up a bit. And we were also going to go ahead and taste some of the beers we're going to be talking about. So IPA, as most of you probably know, stands for India Pale Ale. Um, the most popular kind of IPA around here that you're probably super familiar with is the American IPA, which is the real bitter variety. There's also an English variety that's grouped with other English-derived beers. Um, it's intentionally not spelled out as India Pale Ale because, contrary to the name, it never actually went to India, and a lot of them aren't all that pale, as we are going to go into here in a minute. So, the American IPA. When I first started getting into craft beer, I thought I hated IPAs because the only kind of IPA I had ever had was the American style. More specifically, the American West Coast style, as it's commonly known. It uh, tends to be very hoppy and bitter. It's the modern American or New World hop varieties. They typically have notes of citrus, floral notes, pine, tend to be resinous, kind of coat your tongue. They can be spicy or tropical. Uh, fruity flavors like berry, melon, stone fruit are all very popular. Uh, a lot of versions are dry hopped, which this recipe incorporates. Um, dry hopping refers to adding hops to the beer, um, usually about five days before you ferment. We'll go over why you do it that late um, here in a bit. They tend to have a clean fermentation profile, which means they're clean finishing, so it's not like a wheat beer like we went over on Tuesday that's going to have those kind of banana notes or clove notes or any other kind of funky yeast taste you can get. Um, the yeast isn't really star, the star of the show here, nor the malt, it's definitely the hops. Um, it's clean supporting malt, stuff like two-row, allowing hop character to shine through. So again, the point here is to kind of mute all the other flavors so the hops can really shine. Um, the color for an American IPA is gold to reddish amber. So. When I think pale, I think more straw colored maybe. So golden's not quite pale to me. Um, so I guess that's what, one of the reasons they don't spell it out along with the India thing. Um, the first modern American craft beer example is generally believed to be Anchor Liberty Ale, Anchor Brewing, one of my favorite brewers. Um, it was first brewed in 75, but now that the style has changed, the beer tastes, that beer rather, the Anchor Liberty, would be considered more of a pale ale, not quite as hoppy. Now, there are a wide number of specialty IPAs. Um, they are not a style, or rather, it's not a style unto itself, specialty IPA, more of a category to enter your beer into a competition. If most brewers would agree that what you're making is an IPA, but it's not quite an American IPA like we just laid out, or an English IPA like we talked about, um, it's gonna be one of these specialty beers. Um, they have the balance and overall impression of an IPA, like I was saying, but with some minor tweaks. 
let's take a minute to talk about alcohol content because that's another common way that IPAs are kind of um, broken up. Uh, again, alcohol is typically measured by volume, uh, ABV, although you will occasionally see a beer listed with alcohol by weight from places in Europe. Um, so a session IPA and a session beer in general is going to have an ABV of about 3 to 5 percent which is around the range you typically see for a light beer. A standard IPA is gonna have an ABV of around five to seven percent, which is kind of on the strong side. And a double IPA, also known as an imperial IPA, although double is the technical term that you would use where you enter into this beer in a competition, is gonna have an ABV of 7.5 to 10%, which is definitely on the high side. So the first kind of specialty IPA we're gonna talk about is a Belgian IPA. Um, it has the fruitiness and spice derived from the use of Belgian yeast. If you've ever used anything like T58 in your brewing, if you ever had anything like a triple or um, obviously a Belgian IPA, you'll kind of know what we're talking about. It's A Belgian IPA is like a triple, but brewed with more hops, tend to be a little lighter in color than that as well, and may have a higher ABV. The hop notes are typically tropical stone fruit, citrus, and pine. And the grain is going to have kind of a sweet, malty aroma. Um, there are going to be moderate to high fruity esters, which again is kind of the point when you're using the Belgian yeast. Um, so you might get some banana, pear, or apple aroma from the yeast with a Belgian IPA. Some examples you might find at the store are Green Flash Le Freak or Stone Cali Belgique. Um, another kind of specialty IPA that's very popular is a black IPA. Um, we have one that's pretty popular. I was a little skeptical about it when I looked at the recipe, but it ended up being really good and everyone at the tasting agreed. It's called the Gila Monster Black IPA. Um, it, const it incorporates, if I'm remembering right, the Diablo IPA with a can of the American Porter and some Palisade hops, and it is just outstanding. Um, now, a black IPA has the flavor characteristics of an American IPA, but it's darker in color without strongly roasted or burnt flavors, kind of like a Schwartz beer meeting an IPA. Now, there are um, a couple ways you can get this kind of um, color without the roasted notes. You can either do what's called a cold steep, which means you uh, soak your grains, or steep rather, in the fridge or at room temperature overnight before you add them. You do that with just kind of a standard roast grain. And just the same way that cold brew coffee is a little less astringent and harsh, um, the, that kind of character gets left out from the malt. And you're left with a really smooth, very subtle, and very um, dark colored addition to your beer. Um, oh, I forgot to mention the second way. You could also use a dehusked malt like Carafa or um, Black Prince. Um, you don't have to worry about the cold steep because those are dehusked, so they're not going to have that astringency either. Um, let's see. Like I said, the darker malts are more gentle and supportive. You're not really going to taste it much. Um, the hop characters tend to be stone fruit, tropical, citrusy, resinous, piney, berry, and melon, just like the American IPA. Um, there's low to moderate dark malt aroma. But again, not much taste. It may optionally include light chocolate coffee or toast notes. So again, the kind of notes you typically see with a darker malt, but uh, much more subtle than you would see in a beer like a stout or a porter. Um, there's a smooth mouthfeel, and it's very drinkable. Um, not as heavy as you would expect, as is often the case with dark beers. There's kind of a wide common misconception that dark beers are always heavy, but this is just one example, but that is not true. Um, one commercial example would be Black Watch IPA from Greg Noonan around 1990, or rather that's the first commercial example, Black Watch IPA. And some more contemporary examples would include the, the Shoots Hop in the Dark CDA, or the 21st Amendment Back in Black, which reminds me, an alternate name for a black IPA that I've heard kicked around is a Cascadian IPA. Um, now onto brown IPAs, which are kind of similar, except with a brown IPA, you're going to get the darker malt notes a bit more in the taste and aroma. Um, they are hoppy, bitter, and strong, just like an American IPA, but with caramel, chocolate, and toffee notes that you tend to get from those modestly roasted malts. 
They're more flavorful and malty than the I American IPA. Um, so not quite as hot forward as you might expect with other styles of IPA. Um, again, tropical stone fruit, citrus floral notes are all very common. Chocolate nuts, dark caramel, toffee, and toasted bread flavors are common also for the malts. There's no roasted, burnt, or harsh bitter character, again, like you would expect maybe with a stout or porter. Um, some commercial examples would include the Dogfish Head Indian Brown Ale, which we are going to try today, and the Harpoon Brown IPA. Getting a little bit lighter is the Red IPA. Um, do we still have the Millennium Falconers? No, I or think, the, I think we it wasn't. That one. It wasn't that one. It was the Chubirka. We do. No, that Chubirka's was that was that, that was a Belgian. That's a good example. I'm glad I remembered that one. We can post. We had a red IPA a while ago. I could not have sworn, right now. But not right now. Um, it used the Imperial Red Ale, if I'm remembering right. Regardless, it's again hoppy, bitter, and strong like an American IPA, but with caramel toffee, dark fruit malt character from the darker malts. More flavorful and malty without being sweet or heavy. Um, same kind of hop notes you're going to see with any other IPA. Uh, malt should not constrain hop flavors and aroma, which just means that in any of these IPAs, some of them, like the red and the brown, are going to be slightly more malt forward than other examples, but the malt should still not overpower the hops, so keep that in mind when you're putting together your partial mash recipes. Um, the malts and hops should complement each other. I kind of feel like that goes without saying for every beer, but it's still good to point out. Um, some examples commercially are Sierra Nevada Flipside and Green Flash Hophead Red, Double Red IPA. And we've also got Rye IPAs, which have kind of been gaining popularity. We have a Rye Pale or a Rye IPA? We have a Rye IPA. We've called, called Dry River. River. That's right. Um, it's an American IPA, again, with light grainy spiciness from the rye malts, which can be you know, more subtle or more forward, depending on how much rye you want to put in. Bear in mind, if you're going to use um, an adjunct like flaked, uh, flaked rye, you're going to want to put in something with some diastatic power, like some two row, or six row, or some pills in. Um, let's see here. The rye malt contributes to a dry finish, which again is a common characteristic with IPAs, period. Um, let's see. The bitterness and spice from the rye tends to linger a bit longer than you would get in an IPA. Again, I, mean, I think rye really cuts through everything. It's a pretty strong flavor, just broadly speaking. So um, use it with caution. I made a rye porter once and put way too much and it just killed it. So a little dab will do you. It doesn't have the intense rye malt character of a Rogan beer. Um, some examples would be Sierra Nevada Ruthless Rye and Founders Red Rye. There is also, last but not least, um, a white IPA, which is an American IPA with either the distinctive yeast and or spice additions typical of a Belgian wit beer. So I made a white IPA using Mr. Beer ingredients that went pretty quick when we put it on tap here. I used the long play IPA as a base, and then I did a five minute boil with crushed coriander, a teaspoon, I think, maybe a half teaspoon, I'd have to look it up. And uh, I used lemon zest instead of the orange zest that you would find in a whipped beer. Um, I used Equinot and Mosaic hops. Uh, mosaic is real powerful, so a little bit of mosaic, a lot of Equinot. And I used T58 yeast with some, um, some Belgian malts for the partial mash, and it turned out very well. So the general idea is it's kind of like a wit beerish IPA. So uh, it'll be bitter and hoppy like the IPA. The first time around when I tried to make one, I used the Belgian Weiss beer because I understood the style very poorly. It was not very, or rather it was not nearly bitter enough. It was very good wheat beer, but not a white IPA, so it has to be bitter. Uh, moderate fruity esters, again from the yeast. Um, Clove, coriander, and pepper notes from spice additions. Uh, grains of paradise seed, coriander, both popular choices for your wit beers and your white IPAs. Some commercial examples would be Deschutes Chainbreaker IPA and New Belgium Accumulation. Um, I would also kind of like to add, it's not part of the BJCP thing, but like I mentioned on Tuesday, I'm a big fan of fruit beers. And just like they go very well with um, 
They go very well with wheats. I feel like fruit goes very well with IPAs as well. I did a mango habanero IPA that was very good. Um, you'll see them with all kinds of fruit addition. I think it usually goes really well. Um, hazy IPAs. We're, we're going to start tasting some of these here in a minute. Well, first we've got to do the brewing part, and then for the hot boil. Oh, okay. So, so Renee wants to get drinking, <laughs> but um, we have to show a little bit of restraint around here. Um, <laughs> hazy IPAs, interesting point. Hazy IPAs are kind of a new style, certainly compared to the rest of them. They're also known as Vermont or Northeast IPAs. Um, they're much less bitter. They're hazy, as the name implies. Um, this often comes from, A, a low flocculated yeast, along with stuff like um, wheat malts, certain wheat malts. Um, yes, Pocket Junior, mango habanero. I'll go over that at the end if we have time. New England IPAs. Thank you, Josh. You're right. I always get that flipped around. Regardless, much less bitter, lower IBUs than other IPAs you're going to see. And uh, the hops tend to be really tropical and fruity. Stuff like Citra, Mosaic, um, this Galaxy are all really popular choices for your hazy IPAs. So our partial mash is just about done. So let's get to talking again about our Thunder Bay IPA that we're making. Um, like we said, it's got a 6.7% ABV. It's got an SRM of 10, which is on the lighter side. Again, extract beers tend to turn on the lighter side. Partial match beers are less so in my experience. So um, your mileage may vary. It may turn out a bit darker. That will not affect the taste. Um, 55 IBUs, IBUs being international bitterness units, um, which is how brewers measure how bitter their beer is. It's a scale of 100. Um, so 55 is kind of in the middle. It's not terribly bitter, but it's not exactly mild either. This is going to be good for fans of Two-Hearted IPA, or geez, Two-Hearted Ale from Bell's Brewing, which as many of you may know, I think it was last year, won uh, Best Beer with Zemergy Magazine, which is a big deal, um, joining the greats there. It's also good for fans of Centennial IPA from Founders Brewing. Our Thunder Bay IPA recipe is going to contain One can of American Ale malt extract with the yeast under the lid. You're not going to be using the yeast under the lid for this recipe. I recommend just throwing it in the fridge. It's good to have around in case you ever have a stuck fermentation and you need to repitch. Um, just make sure you bring it back to room temperature before you use it. We're also going to have three uh, pale LMEs, liquid malt extracts. Now, ordinarily, Having three of these would make your beer a bit malt forward, but we are going to do a hot boil as well to kind of counterbalance that. Our own Josh Ratliff was actually the one who wrote this recipe, so I'm sure he'd be happy to take any questions on his thought process when he was coming up with it. This is the advanced stream after all, so we know a lot of you guys are brewing your own recipes. Um, next, we are going to have four packets for half ounce packets of Centennial Pellet Hops. Centennial is kind of um, kind of a really popular IPA hop. Um, and like I said, we're going to do a hot boil. So we'll walk you how to do that, walk you through how to do that. And um, there will also be dry hopping, like I mentioned. So we'll kind of talk about that a bit. This is a partial mash recipe, like we discussed. So you are going to have um, four ounces of two-row pale malt, which is a base malt. If you look at a lot of all-grain recipes, you're going to see that the bulk of them are a grain like two-row, which is going to provide a lot of the fermentables. We'll go over why that matters to us here in a minute. Um, and it's also going to come with Crystal Malt 40, which is also known as Caramel 40. Um, this is more for flavor, color, and aroma. It doesn't really contribute so much to the fermentables. Also gives you a bit of body and head retention from the dextrins in there. This is uh, the non-fermentable sugars, like we talked about with the booster on Tuesday. Um, it's also going to come with five of these muslin hop sacks. Um, now, for this recipe, and just broadly speaking, 
I do not use hop sex. I put my hops in naked. They go in stark raving nude. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason for that will become apparent as I'm going through this, but the, the upshot of it is the hops just kind of dissolve and settle out with the rest of the sediment. So if you're going to be cold crashing your beer, which you should every time anyway, um, it's not going to matter. So with that in mind, you're also going to have one packet of US 05 um, dry ale yeast, which again is a clean finishing ale yeast. It's very popular in IPAs and pails. It's also known as the Chico strain. Um, yep, it's an excellent choice for any kind of IPA or pale ale that you're going to be brewing. So, first we are going to um, go ahead and put our can of extract and our liquid malt extract into um, some hot water to kind of break it up a little bit and not break it up so much as make it a little easier to dissolve. The can I picked, I managed to dent between when we picked it out and now, so I'm going to pick the one that's easier to open. The first thing you do is sanitize. We all know why that's important because this is the advanced stream and we're all advanced brewers. Just checking on my stuff. Um, but when I'm doing partial mash recipes, I like to do things a little out of order. So when you're doing partial mash, what you're going to do, first of all, what I like to do is up the water I'm starting with from four cups to six cups. That's because we want all of our malts or grain, they're pretty much interchangeable terms for us, to be covered up by the water. So we're going to take our four to six cups of water. We're going to go ahead and bring it to 155 to 165 degrees. You can see we got our thermometer here. We're running a little cool. We're running at 140, but since it's just a steep and it's not a mesh, um, it's not the end of the world. We're not really super worried about getting from minimals out of this. Um, let's see. So we're going to leave our grains in there for about um, 30 to 60 minutes once your water gets up to temperature. Now, um, you're going to want to raise your water to what's called strike temperature, which is about 5 to 10 degrees over where you want it to be. The reason is that the room temperature malts are going to bring your temperature down a little bit. Um, you know, unless you have a real good induction burner, you're going to want to keep a real close eye on your temperature. Okay, so our grains have been in here for about, yes, that will be in the directions. Those grains should be covered completely. Josh is absolutely right. Um, they so tend to soak up a little bit. So we, we will um, be losing just a little bit of flavor, aroma, and maybe some fermentables out of that, which is not the end of the world. Um, looks like we have a visitor today. <laughs> Furry visitor. Zax! Now this we, is our office dog, but he's not brewing beer. So, we are going to be boiling that wort, so any dog here that is in there carrying wild yeast or bacteria from um, our friend here is going to get, get killed dead. All right, so our grains have been in there for um, 30 to 60 minutes. So, all right, I'm getting ahead of myself a bit. They can be in there for about another 20 minutes for us. So my point was, while my grains are mashing or steeping, I like to sanitize. That way you save a little bit of time and you're not doing one thing after another. Okay, so sanitizing. It is important because beer is a very attractive environment for bacteria and mold. Um, not the kind that make you sick, but they can definitely cause your beer to develop some off flavors. 
So that's something we want to avoid. So we're going to make sure everything that's going to touch the beer, the fermenter, all those surfaces, and our utensils are sanitized. Um, like I said last time, there are any number of sanitizing products you can use. We're going to go ahead and use the no-rinse cleanser that's included in our refills and recipes. So you're going to take half your packet. You're going to dissolve it in about a gallon of water. Um, what I like to do is use the LBK, a little brown keg fermenter, uh, as the vessel to mix up my sanitizing solution. You can also use it to sanitize your utensils in as long as they are not metal. Metal can cause scratches in the plastic, which can harbor these bacteria and wild yeast, um, which we're trying to avoid. So when you're putting together your fermenter, um, what I like to do is start with the spigot at an angle, kind of like this, and then screw on the nut from the inside until it is all the way down. And then, once it's tight, when you're doing this, you might have noticed it's hard to get a good grip on this, but it's easier to get a good grip on the spigot. And that just kind of makes sure that it's nice and tight. So I'm going to go fill this up with a gallon of water and half a packet of the sanitizing powder, the no rinse cleanser. Uh, the other half of this we are going to save for bottling day so we can sanitize our bottles. Now, while we're, the other reason I like to kind of multitask by using the LBK to mix my sanitizing solution is that it simultaneously tests for leaks, which are very uncommon, but you know, sometimes it gets threaded kind of crooked. Sometimes it's an old LBK and it's getting worn out. Sometimes even those of us who do this for a living put the washer on backwards. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is take my lid screw it on top of the LBK and shake it up real good so I can make sure that all the surfaces in there are getting sanitized. You'll notice when you do this that um, some water is going to leak out of the top. That's because there's two little vents in here in the threads where the lid screws on. You'll notice that our kit doesn't have an airlock like many other kits. That's because these vents in here allow carbon dioxide produced by fermentation to escape but they're small enough that uh, it kind of gets pushed out with enough force to keep out all of those critters we're trying to keep out, along with oxygen. Um, it'll, with uh, the way these fermenters work, you can keep your beer in here for about four weeks before they start getting exposed to anything. All right. and now I'm just gonna Get a little mixing bowl to put some sanitizing solution in for my utensils. All you really need in terms of utensils, you need a whisk, you need a can opener, a spatula. I like to use a flat one because it helps with scraping out the can. Um, the can opener, if I didn't mention that already. You're going to need some tongs when you're doing the partial mash recipe. You don't really have to sanitize the tongs because you're going to boil the work after that anyhow. So I don't worry about that. Um, that is about it in terms of utensils. Oh, if you're doing a partial mash recipe, it helps if you have a strainer. We have strainers that are kind of perfect for this. They're about this size. You'll see it's going to fit the size of our grain sack pretty nicely. So everything that's touching the beer that isn't going to get boiled is going to go in here. Whisk. Okay. 
So we're going to go ahead and turn off our heat. We're going to ditch our thermometer because we don't need it. What we're going to do now is get ourselves about a cup of hot water for doing kind of a mini sparge. A sparge in all grain brewing is when you run water over your grains to increase the efficiency of your brew um, by making sure you're not leaving behind too many fermentables. There are a number of ways to do that. Um, but we do it a real simple way with our partial mash recipe. Since we're using such a small amount of grain, we just need a cup of hot water that we're going to pour over our grain sack in the strainer. And we're going to do that without squeezing the grain sack at all, which is because um, that can get tannins from the malt in your beer. Tannins are a chemical with a kind of like harsh astringent flavor. We're just going to kind of give that a minute and turn it around a little bit. But you know, like I said, since we're using such a small amount of grain, um, I'm not terribly worried about getting every last drop, especially considering the bulk of our fermentables are going to come from our can of HME. So that would be good enough. So what we're going to do now is called a hot boil. Um, so there are a number of reasons you would add hops to beer. Um, the three of them are bittering, flavor, and aroma. Now our canned extract already has bittering and flavor hops in them. So you do not ever need to do a hot boil when you're using our HME. However, if you want your beer to have some more hop flavor or character or a different kind of hop than what is already in it, you can do a hop boil, which is pretty much what it sounds like. Um, now, you cannot boil hops in water alone. The reason is that the way hop molecules are, um, they kind of need some fermentable sugars to stick to. Um, so, you need to boil your hops either in um, some wort like this, which is pretty much just grain water with just a little bit of fermentable sugar in it. If you weren't going to be doing a partial mash recipe, but you still wanted to do a hop boil, you could boil that LME, that liquid malt extract we're going to be adding, um, or you could use DME, dry malt extract. There's not a whole lot of difference between how they come out. It's just the form that they come in is a bit different. Um, so with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and bring our water to a boil. I'm going to put the lid on it at first just to, um, just to speed up our process a little bit. But um, you're going to have what's called a hop schedule, which is kind of going to tell you how long to brew your hops. So. This is going to have a 15 minute hop boil. So we're going to boil a half ounce of hops for 15 minutes. Then we're going to add in another half ounce of hops for another five minutes. Um, yes, super fun for sugar fungus. We are drinking beer today, later. Here in a minute. <laughs> Patience, my friends. We're excited too. Um, you know what? I had that twisted. It's actually going to be a 10 minute hot boil. So we're going to wait for it to come to a boil. There will be what's called, if I'm remembering right, a heat break where it gets super foamy. Um, and that's when we're going to add in our hops. We're going to brew a half, rather boil a half ounce for five minutes, add another half ounce, give it another five minutes, take it off the heat and add another half ounce, which is called adding it flame out. Um, and then our last half ounce is going to get dry hopped. Again, at this point, if you were so inclined, you could be putting your hops in a hop sack. Again, it's not really necessary, and this is the advanced stream, so I'm assuming all you guys are cold crashing your beer like we do anyway. Are there any questions on hop boils or hop use in general or anything at all we've done over so far while I'm getting this ready? Any chatters in there?
That's okay. I'm shy too. <laughs> again, you're never going to want to boil the canned HME because, again, it already has the bittering hops in it. Um, so the effect you get out of hops is going to be dependent on how long you boil them. If you want bittering, you're going to boil them for 30 to 60 minutes. If you want flavor, you're going to boil them for uh, about 15, well, more like 10 to 30 minutes, I think. Flavor hops is kind of a controversial um, label for them. Some brewers will say there's no such thing. It's just bittering and aroma. I've read in a couple places. But regardless, um, we find that we get flavor if you boil for, five, for rather 10 to 30 minutes. And then 10 minutes or less, or adding them at flame out, or dry hopping is only going to contribute aroma. We get a lot of new brewers asking, can I make my beer more bitter just by throwing some hops in it when I take it off the burner? The answer is no. That will get you great hop aroma, not much flavor. Now, like I said, um, ordinarily, or rather, with a style like this that you want to be hop forward, if you're going to be doing like we are and adding a bunch of liquid malt extract that is not hopped, you're going to want to entertain the idea of doing a hop boil to kind of counterbalance that a bit. Um, does one of you guys have a timer so we can time the... If not, we'll just yeah. look at the clock. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let me know when you want to start. Sounding pretty active in here, but it's a misleading sound. It's still very still. Do you have to cover the grains during the boil with a lid? First of all, you do not boil the grains. You mash the grains. Again, that means, well, mash or steep, which again means bringing the beer, or rather the water, up to 155 to 165 degrees. By the time you are boiling, the grains have to be out. If the grains are still in there when you're boiling, it's going to taste terrible. So, um, and you never cover a boil. Wow, way to put me on blast in front of the whole internet, Josh. <laughs> Sitting there at home, we're talking the trash on us hardworking people. Um, well, you know, I'm lazy and in a hurry. But, regardless, um, you're going to want to boil the bare minimum of fermentables that you can to get the necessary effect. Um, the reason is that uh, it can kind of start to darken and caramelize the malts. So um, if we added all three LMEs in there, we might end up with a pretty dark beer that might uh, not be what we were hoping for. So if we were going to um, be doing an all extract version, we would only put one of the LMEs in there. We wouldn't put all three. Like Josh points out, DMS is the common cause of off flavors in beer. It can also show up when you're doing an all grain batch with a lot of pills and malt. Why on earth would you want to have a creamed corn IPA? You're a sick man, <laughs> should from this. Get help. Um, so again, we're looking for that heat break, which it'll look really foamy. So we're just waiting for it to foam up. Is that why we're boiling it right now? Yeah, just giving it a little bit more time. Okay. It would not be the worst thing in the world if you added them a little early, but we're trying to do things right Patience. here. In. Yes, it is not my strong suit, <laughs> I fully admit it. So, what's everybody's favorite IPA? I want to know. We had one here in Tucson by Borderlands Brewing called Sitting in a Tin Can that was a hazy IPA that we got to drink here in the office that was really good. We've been having a lot of good hazy IPAs lately. Um, do you want to, Renee, do you want to walk us through the beers that we're going to be tasting? Yes. I'll show it to you guys while it's boiling and then we'll drink them later. And, to put them in the right order. and I already kind of talked to you guys through what we're going to be doing for the hot boil, so I'm just kind of going to do it while we're talking about it. 
This looks like a low rolling boil to me, so I'm gonna start my hot boil and I'll just keep an eye on the time. Oh, you'll keep an eye on the time? Yeah, I'll watch it. Okay. Alright, I'm gonna move this aside. So what we grabbed here, and I tried to put them in the right order, but you know what, Josh is in the chat and he will correct me if I am wrong. Uh, we grabbed a couple different ones, given um, at any time that you go into a brew store, they might not have all of these different IPA styles, but we grabbed uh, a West Coast Red here that looked pretty tasty. That's the first one I wanted to try. And then we grabbed this beautiful uh, local Pueblo Vida uh, Benthos, I might be saying that wrong, India Pale Ale. Such a cool can. That one sounds really good. It's a, and it's, ops. this one's a hazy. So since everyone in the office really likes hazies, I figured, okay, let's do that thing. Also, Robert will probably break in here to try some with us. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I also grabbed a brown. We were lucky enough to find a brown one in the store. Um, this one's from Dogfish Head. Looks pretty good. Uh, let's see, what else do I have in my little bag here? Oh, this one has a really cool can. This is a black rye IPA, so it's actually two of the styles Tim brought up, like, in one. Oh, uh, it's sure to be interesting. I, I actually haven't had a rye IPA, rye IPA in a long time, so we'll see if I like those. I don't know either. Uh, and then another one that's two of the different um, specialty IPAs Tim brought up is the double black IPA from Lost Highway. That's another Arizona one. And if you tuned in yesterday, you probably saw us... Uh, the guys drinking the Viejo Imperial IPA from Iron John's, that's a double. So there's another one. There's a lot of doubles in here. I didn't mean to do that. I really didn't, but sure to be tasty. Um, but I'll, I'll wait. I'll stop trying to drink all of them right now. I'll be patient and let the boil happen. Thank you. We just <laughs> added our first half ounce of hops. As you can see, it's all green and pretty looking. It smells great in here right now. Our entire office stinks of hops every time we do a hot boil, and we love it, and that is why I try to work a hot boil into every recipe I do. Now, so back to the fermentables part. Um, the beer that I had originally thought about doing today was the Golden Empire IPA. Now that one, the only malt in it is Carapils. As a lot of our more advanced brewers probably know, Carapils do not contribute any fermentable sugars to your beer nor color or flavor or aroma really um but what they do add is dextrins which as we've been over a couple times adds body and head retention to your beer so um if you were only steeping carapils just to add some body and head retention to your beer that is not good enough for your hot boil if we were doing the golden empire ipa and we wanted to do a hot boil we would have had to add one of our LMEs in there. Like Josh points out, if you start losing water due to the boil, it doesn't hurt to add a cup of hot water. Um, our boil is so short though, I'm not terribly concerned about that. It's already a third of the way over. Um, you know the black IPA? Ooh, that sounds like a good blog. I could do that. You should do that. I, okay. Here's the Gila. We can post the Gila. Forum. We'll link you to the Gila, and then Matt, why don't you also link to the Chromos beer, which is not a black IPA, but uses the same cold steeping procedure that you would use if you were making a black IPA with the black malts that you can use. Coming up on time here to add our second hop edition in our hop schedule. Once more, I forgot to sanitize my funnel, so I'm using my sheer bottle that we often use here when we're in a hurry. Oh, it's so close. So like I was saying, I thought I hated IPAs for the longest time because the only ones I ever had were those super bitter ones coated your tongue and you just taste bitterness you don't taste anything else and it stays in your tongue for like five minutes and yeah it's got a high ABV but is it really worth it and I know a lot of you probably love that style but I do not which always kind of bumped me out that it was sort of the style everyone thinks to or rather goes to when they think of craft beer 
Um, so I think the first one I had that was different was the R Black IPA, and it was just really smooth, not too bitter. I'm letting the uh, solution out of our fermenter, by the way, since it's almost going to be time to be adding our beer. Um, yeah, hazy IPAs are also much, much different. If you guys think you hate IPAs, I really encourage you to seek out some of these different styles. Should I set a timer for you, Tim? Okay. Should we be? How long? Five more minutes. Five more minutes? anything interesting about the history of the style when you were doing your research for this uh, Yeah, episode? I mean, I like the point that like all the ones we're talking about right now are um, American IPs, and they made the distinction, like you mentioned at the beginning, that, that the whole history bound to the English style is not so true of what we now have as an American IPA and like what we expect of our style. And then um, another interesting thing, <laughs> another interesting thing I found is that the specialty, I, okay, I'll just stand in front of the camera. Thank you. Okay, so the other cool thing, and Josh told me this, Josh knows what's up. Um, currently, because the Hazy IPA doesn't actually have a category, um, if you were to make one, often for competitions, it gets listed as a specialty IPA, because like I said, the specialty IPA is sort of for competition. It's sort of beers that don't quite have a place yet, but are te technically in some regard an American IPA. So I kind of right now I'm thinking of all those specialty IPAs as sort of like mashups, if you will. So like a black IPA is sort of like an American IPA and a Schwarzbier like mashed up. Or the brown one is a brown ale and an IPA mashed up. So I actually haven't had a lot of these in a long time and I'm pretty excited to try them again and, and see if I can note the mashup. Same here. <laughs> got three oh, minutes. that's uh, on the floor back there. That is actually a white wine. A Pinot, to be specific, if I'm remembering right. I don't know much about wine yet. <laughs> I will soon. I wish it was mead. I love brewing mead, but we are putting together a wine kit right now um, to kind of join all of our other non-beer products like our kombucha, our cider. Um, but anyway, um, if any of you have ever brewed wine, it's not terribly different from brewing mead. We do need a mead cast. I would absolutely do that. I would love to do a mead cast. I just did um, dry mead with a varietal honey, with pumpkin honey, where uh, all the pollen was harvested from pumpkin flowers, which obviously doesn't taste like pumpkin. It's still a little young, but it has kind of herbal spicy notes that I wasn't expecting, but are very good. I also tried to do a sweet mead that came out way too sweet, so now I'm gonna mix it with a cider to make a sicer. Um, and the first mead I did, I put way too much buckwheat honey in because I misunderstood Josh's advice. And um, to cover that up, I turned it into an apricot mellow melt, which actually came out pretty good. If you overlook the fact that you lost about half of it to over foaming when you opened the bottles because I was impatient and bottled it before it was done fermenting. Mead is much different than beer, and if we ever do um, a mead cast, we can go into a great deal of detail about that. How are we looking on the time? Uh, you got about a minute and a half left. What's kind of cool is behind your head, you can see the wall of beers we brewed on Twitch already, like just out of the corner of your eye, and it is literally becoming a wall. Like, we have to start bottling soon. Like, we seriously don't know when we're even going to drink all this. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of beer. Um, so, <laughs> let's talk water real quick. Um, the long and the short of it is, if water tastes good to drink, it's going to make good beer, with the exception that you're going to want to steer clear of reverse osmosis and distilled water. They lack the minerals that yeast need to survive. Um, a lot of people use spring water, especially people who have their own well sources. I'm jealous of them. I usually recommend steering clear of tap water because it can have chlorine in it, which can interact with yeast in such a way that it produces kind of a plasticky band-aid taste which we are trying to avoid. Um, 
You have about 30 seconds left, and then you can oh, get going. Oh, I almost forgot to open my cleanup house. Not me. That's right. Guys, you can always distract him by bringing up mead. He'll go right off track. That's true. You <laughs> should see all the empty mead bottles at my desk. It's almost a problem. Ten, nine, eight, eight seven, seven six, six, five, four. <laughs> Three, two, one. Oh my goodness, I forgot to turn off the heat <laughs> first. You know, it really doesn't matter that much at that point if you do it right before, right after. So now, we're gonna go ahead and get our extract. I'm gonna leave it on the burner this time. I learned my lesson. Again, I like to take off the wrapper because little pieces of it can, every now and again, end up in your wort. Like Josh points out, if you are forced to use chlorinated tap water, giving it a bit of... Oh my goodness. And of course it landed sticky side down. <laughs> yeah. Leave it, leave it. Oh. I will not, you litter bug. Um, but again, you know, you're going to want to use cold water because uh, you want your yeast to be at about 65 Fahrenheit when you pitch it. Now, it seems to me in my own brewing that SO5 is not as sensitive to acetaldehyde as other yeast can be. It's very clean finishing. It can tolerate a slightly, oh my goodness, almost got away from you. It can tolerate a slightly warmer and slightly cooler temperature than um, our standard yeast that comes with most of our refills. Again, you're going to want to try and get every drop of the stuff out that you can because the more that you leave in, the more alcohol, flavor, color, and aroma you're going to lose, along with hop bitterness, especially with the canned hopped malt extracts, you're really going to want that hop bitterness because this is an IPA. And the fact that we're using the American Ale to make an IPA really goes to show that you are not constrained by the style that your can is, you know, quote, supposed to be. You could take the classic American light and turn it into a stout. You can take the American ale and turn it into an IPA. You can take the Canadian blonde and make it a wheat beer. It really just depends what you want to do. We're just mixing it up a little bit so it doesn't stick to the bottom. We do have some LMEs to add in still. I wish I could remember where I left the scissors. <laughs> all right, so we're just gonna kind of move our spatula out of the way a bit so it doesn't get all sticky. Um, I kind of like to start squeezing it from the bottom, kind of like a tube of toothpaste, or how a tube of toothpaste starts before you start squeezing it from the middle and get lazy and ruin the whole thing. <laughs> Again, the more that you leave behind in the packet, the more alcohol, flavor, color, and aroma you are going to lose. In this instance, we are using an LME that is complementary to the style that kind of matches the HME that we're using. But like I was saying, if you wanted to take our robust LME and add it to a classic American light, you'd get something more like a stout. Or if you wanted to add the smooth LME to the Canadian Blonde and maybe do a short hot boil, you'd get something more like an Amber. So you are not at all constrained by the style it lists on the can. Just about done with number two and on to number three. Oh no, that was close. Yeah. That's, it's those dad reflexes, man. <laughs> right. So 
so again, just giving that a quick stir. You'll see there is no trace of our pellets, but you can kind of see the hot particles floating around in there. So if you want to use hop sacks, you can, but again, not a big fan because they kind of, in my opinion, slow everything down. Now with this recipe, you're not going to see the dry hop here, but we are going to do a dry hop, which means we're going to add that last packet of hops um, to our fermenter about five days before we bottle. The reason we do it so late is because hop oils are very volatile and they dissipate very quickly. That is the reason why, like we discussed on Tuesday, the IPAs and wheat beers and saisons um, are among the beers that do not condition very well. Conditioning referring to the aging process where you age your beer usually in the bottles. The longer you let it sit, the more hop aroma you're going to lose. So the sooner you drink these, the better. You might have to kind of balance that out if you're going to do an imperial or double IPA. That's going to have a real high ABV because those can still have a little bit of that harshness that you can get from the high ABV beers right after they're done brewing. So now that our work is all made up, we are going to fill our fermenter to the number one or four quart line, whichever we have. As Josh points out, and I mentioned earlier, if you're not going to use hop sacks, you have to cold crash because it's going to make way more sediments. Um, what I like to do when I cold crash is prop up the spigot end of the fermenter with a couple books you don't care that much about, don't mind getting leaked on. That makes all the sediments settle away from the spigot so you end up with less in the bottles. Ending up with a bunch of sediment in the bottles is not the end of the world. But, um, you know, if you catch a mouthful of this troop, the sediment doesn't taste very good. You're always going to have a little bit of sediment in the bottles no matter what you do because the carbonation process. Now we're pouring our hot wort into our fermenter through the funnel. Now that we have some cold water in there to bring down the temperature and not work with plastic. Um, what was I talking about? Cold crashing? Um, I usually give it two days when I cold crash. Oh, I was saying you're always going to have a little bit of sediment in the bottom of your bottles no matter what because um, the carbonation process is technically a kind of fermentation. We just don't call it fermentation because that makes everything super confusing. Um, So if you notice a little bit on the bottom of your bottles, it's not priming sugar that didn't get mixed in and you didn't mess anything up, it's just from the carbonation process. Now we're filling up our fermenter to the number two and or eight quart line um, with more cold water. So the purpose of this is to get a little bit of oxygen in your work because yeast, just like us, needs a little bit of oxygen to get by. Um, once you pitch your yeast, you do not want to let your beer come into contact with oxygen. Um, that is why when you take your lid off to dry hop, you're going to be very quick about it. You're not going to perv your beer and get it infected by um, taking off the lid three times a day to look at it because it's so pretty. So that's good and foamy. We'll call that good enough. Now we are going to pitch our yeast. Every now and then you'll get a brewer who insists that you need to have a starter. 
since we're doing such small batches, the cell count of the yeast is going to be real high. We really don't have to worry about that. You'll also occasionally get some people who say that you have to rehydrate it, which it might say on the yeast packet itself. But as Josh is so fond of pointing out, the yeast gets rehydrated when it hits the wort. So we really don't have to worry too much about that here. You're going to want to put the beer in a location with a temperature, that's not the lid, um, with a temperature between um, 59 and 60 71.6 degrees. Like I said, I find that this beer is a little more tolerant of the warmer end of that range than a lot of other yeasts you'll find. Um, after about 24 hours, you should be able to see the fermentation process happening in your fermenter. Now, we get a lot of people asking if an absence of foam means that their beer is not fermenting. It does not. Um, foam is not a very reliable indication of fermentation. Sometimes you'll get a batch that doesn't have any foam for like the first five days and then it starts building it up. Sometimes you'll get a beer that has a lot of krausing for like the entire fermentation. Um, sometimes you'll get a beer that starts off really strong and then the foam dies away. So the better way to see if your beer is fermenting is to look for flocculation, to look for that um, sediment or tube collecting at the bottom of your fermenter. You might have to kind of shine a flashlight in there, but it's usually pretty obvious. Um, your fermentation will usually reach its peak or high krausen in three to five days, two to five days rather. Um, like I said, five days before bottling, you're going to go ahead and add that last packet of hops in the fermenter. If you're going to use a hop sack when you dry hop, you're going to want to go ahead and boil it for a couple minutes. Um, if not, you don't really have to worry about it. Um, um, you'll ferment for 21 days total. Uh, now, you can often get away with as little as two weeks. And again, with a beer like this, an IPA, since this is the advanced stream, we don't recommend deviating from the instructions a little. Um, it is okay to go ahead and ferment this beer for just two weeks, I would say, I think. If you do that, you're going to want to make sure your fermentation temperature is warm enough. You might want to entertain the idea of taking hydrometer readings so you don't bottle it before it's ready and get bottle bombs. If you're worried about it, you can give it the whole 21 days. It doesn't really hurt anything week won't make a big difference. Um, but just because there's nothing visible happening does not mean that the beer's not brewing. So, are we gonna? Yeah, are we gonna? I'm asking you yeah. to. Yeah, we're gonna. Okay. So, <laughs> now that we're done brewing, oh wow, Robert's here for the drinking portion. That is a surprise. I will show up for the, for the best parts, Tim. I cannot believe it. But I studied your brewing skills that are magical. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, let's scoot this back. Alrighty, I'm gonna put these. Hey Matt, can you see these pretty well yep. where you're at? Looks Excellent, handy. wonderful. Okay guys, uh, I really wanted to do this back at the beginning when we were explaining the style so you can really see the color uh, difference and kind of see why one is sort of a mashup of an IP and a amber or something like that. So the first one that I'm cracking open is that West Coast Red that I showed earlier from Refuge Brewery. I do not know where these guys are from, guys. If you tell me, uh, let me know. I don't know. So this is what a red IPA looks like. Ooh, poured a little too fast there. Okay. And this is the one everyone in here is chomping at the bit to get a taste of. This is the Hazy, back here from Pebla Vida. I'll pour it now. That's the only reason I showed up. That's the only reason. What am I pouring it? You guys going to come here? What? 45, 45 degree, degree angle? So the, uh, oh. Okay. There we go. There it is. Beautiful. Move these beauties down the line a little here. And here comes our brown IPA. Ooh. Who's that from? This is Dogfish Head. It's called an Indian Brown. It's actually labeled as just a dark IPA. Really I know dark. I'm not pouring it at a 45 degree angle. The guys are going to choke me over it. Here you go. 
<laughs> and then, okay, this is the one that I said had a really, really cool can. I'm super excited to see the color on this one. And this is uh, black rye. Here we go. There, there, there you go. You guys can come and grab these ones up while I'm Tim pouring. First choice, then. Yeah? Oh, Tim, you want to grab it? this? Look how beautiful the, this uh, one is. The first one you want? Which one do you want? The green one. This one? That yeah, get at it. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right. So, like I said, this is the brown. You can see the color. Here is a black rye. This one's sure to be bold in flavor. Uh, and now for this double black, this is sure to... Ooh, that's a cool top. Cool tops, yeah. Oh, okay. They're looking so this... <laughs> Ah, no, spill everywhere. But yeah, here's Go the ahead. top. So I was going to pull the Kansas. Yeah, what's cool about Mother Road is they are Arizona, and they do like the old school like pop top cans. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it on the front camera. I'm not sure. All right. Yeah, okay, cool. So, ooh, this one looks very smooth. This one looks tasty. Here we go. Moving it down the line. So that is a black rye, that is a double black. And our final one is the Viejo that you guys had yesterday. Another local beer. Correct. From Iron Drums. Ooh. What do you think of the Pueblo Vida, Tim? It's good. It's um, slightly more bitter than I would have expected for a hazy, but again, I'm a huge wuss with the bitterness. <laughs> so it might just be me. Um, pretty subtle hop aroma for the style too. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. Um, a little bit citrusy, a little bit fruity. Um, got kind of that almost sweet aroma from the Amarillo hops. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to show that these are both doubles, but look at the color difference here because one is a black and one is just a double. So it's just a little darker than maybe straw colored. Um, so the funny thing of having me pour all of these is everybody in the office has opinions and everyone in the office has their favorites. And I actually do not like IPAs, so I'm curious to see if I like these. I'm actually going to start by trying the Imperial, um, which is probably not the best place to start because it's going to be super strong, but yes, I'm going to give it a spin. Oh, we get to see the funny face you make. That's right. That is really, really, really smooth. Get in there, Robert. Get some. Here you go. Doing some of that. Okay. It. And Matt behind the camera needs some beer, too. <laughs> Thirsty Matt. Doing it again. Yeah. This is delicious. So this is that Iron John's. This is super smooth. For someone who doesn't, like you were saying, when you started, you didn't really like IPAs. Right, because uh, I I'm thought they were all, I thought they were all really bitter and kind of you had to work your way through drinking them. And I didn't get why everyone liked craft beer so much. And like I said, I was even relieved when I found out there were kinds of craft beer that weren't West Coast IPAs. Um, <laughs> do you want to try some more? Yeah, I do. Know. I kind of want to. I want to try the double because. This one, the one I'm trying. Yeah, because. It's super tasty. You know, it's funny. I I say I don't like this style or that style, but every now and then I'll find one that I really like. Um, double IPAs being no exception. Mm. Huh? That smells pretty good. Yes. And then it's surprisingly yes. smooth for an imperial. Wow. Obviously much more bitter than the hazy with a really dry finish. Um, not very, what's the ABV on this? Mm -hmm. 10. That's Ten. why it's so good. Wow, well, it's <laughs> not very boozy for a 10% ABV beer like okay. you would expect. Yeah. Right now you should try the rye. You want me to try this rye? Yeah, Let's see that's what happens, one guys. People are curious to see how it tastes. Okay, and here we go. Yeah, you can smell that. Ooh. That is, wow, that's so different. I'm, honestly, I've been here for a couple of years and I still have beers where I'm like, that tastes not like beer at all. That's totally different. And this is the red, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's their red one. The first one that I poured. Yeah, the, the aroma's a little bit more malty. And yep, it's kind of in between bitterness as far as the imperial and the hazy. You kind of get the caramel notes. It's not as hop forward. So, I mean, just, I'm no judge, but going by the guidelines as we, uh, we read them, I mean, it seems like all these beers are lining up real well with what we expected. 
Um, I actually have been reading about a style that kind of caught my interest, India Pale Lagers, um, which as you guys probably know are a strain of yeast that ferments more at in the 50s, from about 50 to 60. Um, you'll find it in a lot of German beers, you'll find it in a lot of American beers like Bud Light. They have a really crisp, clean finish, which is kind of what they're known for. Um, and I really want to brew one and try one because I think it's an interesting idea. Yep. I really get like how there. creative on, brewers get this. Get in there. I'll take my glasses away. Matt's in here. Do we have red. an IPL recipe tip on our website or no? No, I, you know what happened? I started to brew it and I used cryo hops and it was going to be delicious. And then I let it cold crash for too long and it got oxidized because I forgot about it over a long weekend. So I ruined my own beer. As you guys can hear, those of us who do this for a living still make mistakes like this. So what's your favorite beer tip so far of these? Of these? Yes. Definitely the hazy. I'm a big fan of Pueblo Vida. Next week I am actually moving into a house that's like four blocks from Pueblo Vida. So I consider this a preview of my new... So you can start picking up Pueblo Vida beers for us at the office. I don't know about all that. <laughs> no. It's so convenient. Uh, not that convenient. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is a really good hazy. It's super tasty. So, um, yeah. So I guess we've definitely seen that there is a very wide variety of IPAs. It's not just what you might think. It's not just what you might see on the shelf at the grocery store or uh, the most popular varieties. So I cannot stress this enough, especially if you guys want to be advanced brewers and you want to start making some stuff that's different, you got to get out there and try different things. If you just keep getting the same local craft that's on the shelf at the gas station, you're never going to really expand your knowledge. So the more beer you drink, the better your, the beer you brew is going to be.